Uh, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, today we have a lot to go through. I'm just going to say a few words on the world situation and introduce uh, Fred Haight, who I think everyone here is pretty familiar with, um, who's given us the honor of, of venturing a very long way from Ontario to give uh, his fourth lecture here in Montreal on the subject of reviving the principles of classical culture, which is increasingly becoming, uh, with all of the developments around the new Silk Road, around the new a paradigm which our organization has been talking about for decades and fighting for, uh, the issue of what is a true human culture which is durable and fit to survive without expecting any uh, perpetual collapses is becoming a, a key topic in, in leading thinkers around the world. Um, because up until now we've been told that culture is, a, is something which is fundamentally based upon the laws of the jungle. And that's what a lot of the Western uh, brainwashing has done to us, is that a lot of people think of human civilization as being something which uh, is intrinsically animalistic, it's intrinsically imperial, that nations naturally act like empires at the expense of their neighbors, eating up resources until those resources cause population uh, boundary conditions to contract closer and closer until you get a a fundamental, natural collapse of that population called the Dark Age. And then eventually after Dark Age, the whole cycle reproduces itself. And this is what we often have all encountered with this cyclical idea of human history. Now our organization, Lyndon LaRouche, uh, set up this organization a very long time ago based upon his discoveries in physical economy that were based on a principle of natural law that completely rejected that idea that collapses perpetually are the condition of man. Because sure, we can you know, make mistakes and follow uh, opinions and assumptions regarding what our, we are, what the future is, based on better lies. We can act upon ideas that are not truthful. And we do that through our own free will to not seek what's true and, and act accordingly. And sure, we can pay the consequences of not being creative and thus you know, resorting to bar barbarism, wars for oil, wars for resources, and then collapse. Or we can choose to feed our, our divine side, our, the side of us which expresses creative reason in ways that no other species in the biosphere can do. So, <clears throat> the issue now of what is a culture which intrinsically does that, which, which has at its heart and soul the, a principle of constant creative development and change in a lawful way, not just any old way. This is now increasingly something that we all have to think deeply about and then master certain discoverable, intelligible principles that express themselves in science and art and act accordingly. Because now we're coming to a point where these two systems that we know have coexisted for quite some time, the humanist system that's based upon a principle that man has these, these divine attributes, and the oligarchical system that says that man is just the material uh, passions and genetic dis you know, qualities that make us up physically, these two systems can no longer coexist and something's gonna give. So a few days ago, the world was a very different place. Um, Helga LaRouche, I've got a uh, latest issue of EIR here, which for anybody not subscribed, should definitely subscribe to this uh, ASAP. It's a, a weekly publication we've been doing for 40 plus years, with a picture of Helga Tsef LaRouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute, and the wife of Lyndon LaRouche, at the Beijing conference, the Belt and Road conference, which took place between the 14th and 15th of May. And at first we were a little surprised, uh, you know, we, we knew that this conference was, was obviously going to happen. We were, we've been building to get representation from the United States, from Canada, to be at that conference so that the West could transition towards letting go of this collapsing imperial Wall Street Brit British uh, system and em embark in, in a new system of growth and win-win cooperation. We've been fighting for that for a long time, as everybody here knows. Uh, we got a little text message from one of our members in the States saying they were watching the proceedings of Xi Jinping and Putin speaking at the keynote address and said, hey, you won't believe who I just saw in the front row. It was Helga, Helga, Helga Tsef LaRouche was right there in the front row. And sure enough, there's all of these videos of her just sitting in the front row. And it wasn't just that, but we found out soon thereafter that she actually was invited to give a presentation at this major conference, which occurred, I mean, this is something which featured over 130 countries, almost 30 heads of state. Uh, Putin was the, the guest of honor. And the thing that we had been fighting for for many, many months, in the very last days leading up to the conference, actually occurred, which was that the US announced at the last minute that they would send a delegation uh, to that conference, 
which resulted in, in things that a lot of people don't even realize who watch the media. Unless you actually use our, our material, you won't know about most of the actual decisions and policies that were agreed upon coming out of that conference. One of which is the fact that there was a, um, a U.S. Belt and Road Working Group that's now being created that's going to operate out of the U.S. Embassy in China that Pottinger, the, the, uh, the security advisor that Trump selected to go to China representing the U.S. with the team, uh, established with his Chinese counterparts. Um, an invitation has now been openly given for China to come to this June 18th to, the, to 20th U.S. infrastructure summit, which will feature the types, all of the projects that the U.S. Can, can build based upon Trump's $1 trillion infrastructure program, which he was committed to in the course of, his, of the elections. This obviously is something we've been explaining couldn't work if we don't have international cooperation by China, by Japan, by other countries, because the money's just not there on Wall Street. The whole system is actually wired to prevent long-term investments into things like mega projects of infrastructure and scientific and technological progress. So now you have the Chinese Investment Corporation. Uh, the president did an interview with the Wall Street Journal a little while ago where he announced that they're going to be setting up a, an office in Manhattan, the first one other than one in Canada of its kind in, North Amer in the Western Hemisphere, in order to harmonize US-Chinese investments on major infrastructure pro uh, projects and other things. Um, Mike Billington, who gave a presentation a few days ago, made the point that one thing lacking in this whole discussion was the, nature, the, the creation of the National Infrastructure Bank of America that has to, has to happen if we're going to be successful in, in building and carrying through all of these major projects. But we're very close at this point. And Helga Sepp made a speech, or a, she gave an interview on, a, on CGTV, which is the, the biggest television network in China, where she said, I am convinced that yesterday, this is a day after the conference, we experienced the formation of a new world economic order. It was a truly historic moment. And I think most of the participants in the Belt and Road Forum had that profound sense of being in the middle of making history for a new era of civilization. I am very excited because this is a phase change for humankind. And Xi Jinping echoed that by saying that China, in his speech at the Belt and Road Summit, said that China has found a master key for solving all of the world's problems, poverty, hunger, war, and beyond. And it's true, this master key is a commitment to the constant development uh, and creative change. Um, other I mentioned there were 29 heads of state. Uh, just a few of the, the excerpts from some of these heads of state are really bold and brilliant, where you can see coming out of this, people like the Czech president, Milo Zeman, said, in all of history, except for the Marshall Plan, there was practically no long-term project which needs enormous courage. Let me express my gratitude for People's Republic of China for this courage, and especially let me appreciate China's president, uh, Xi Jinping, for the courage, which is so rare. And Russian President Putin said, poverty, social chaos, the development, the development level of countries and regions, all this creates a breeding ground for international terrorism, extremism, as well as irregular migration. We shall not be able to live up to these challenges should we fail to overcome the stagnation of, the global, economic, of global economic development. Um, the... Uh, Milo Zeman, uh, the Czech president, even went so far as to say when he was confronted with people who said, well, isn't the Belt and Road uh, design only crafted geopolitically by the Chinese to break Europe? And he made the point to say that, no, Europe is already broken. This is going to save Europe. <laughs> um, now, there have been, this is something which our organization was promoting as early as the early 1990s, this idea of rebuilding the world based upon a, a uh, renouvellement of European Chinese <clears throat> cultures that would spread all the way through the Eurasian zone, uplifting people in the Middle East, that would connect down to Africa, through Russia, that would have connections in the Arctic through the Bering Strait into the Americas, and we've written thousands of reports on this matter over the course of many years. Uh, this is something which the British Empire and the, the oligarchical planners who have seek to maintain their structures of control based in the, in the West based in Britain in the, the financial centers of London, have striven very hard to try to stop at all costs. Uh, the most effective means that was selected so far has been uh, economic warfare, 
things that you know we know of George Soros doing, as well as irregular warfare, the you know sponsorship of terrorism, and all sorts of uh, movements that create only chaos in places like the Middle East and Africa, especially, but beyond. Um, also, territorial conflicts between countries that have natural, organic, common interests. Uh, the British have been a special, uh, have specialized over many, many generations in creating artificial conflicts over uh, territory, boundary conditions between Pakistan, India, China, Japan, you name it, Canada and Russia over the North, North Pole. Uh, th there's no reason for any of these things, but they get small-minded people to go and fight over things that are ultimately going to destroy them both. Uh, coming out of the conference, uh, the, the Belt and Road Conference, we've seen the, difu the diffusion. The diffusion. The, the, okay, the, a lot of these points of tension have been remarkably diffused very quickly. It doesn't mean that a war danger is still not, on, is still not something we should be very concerned about, but many of the fuses that would have unleashed that chain reaction of war have been diffused in a, in a way that I'm going to go, go through very quickly. Um, one of which was that uh, Japan did send a delegation the head of the, the Japanese ruling party met with Xi Jinping, met with the Chinese, his Chinese counterparts, and arranged to start setting up a meeting between Xi Jinping visiting Japan and the Japanese Prime Minister Abe visiting China. This is something which is absolutely necessary if we're going to begin to get some resolution to the problems in the Pacific uh, that have a very long history, going back to World War II and before that even. Um, North Korea was actually represented, which none of the media talks about. And sure enough, there is some belligerent uh, actions, shooting missiles and things. But we actually had a delegation from North Korea that was there that met with their South Korean counterparts and had brilliant discussions about the need to cooperate uh, with the new uh, South Korean policy, because there is a new government in South Korea. The old government of uh, Park Gun hee was, was impeached. Now we have a new uh, prime minister named Moon Jae-hin who wants to bring back a sunshine policy, which is the old policy of the 90s and early 2002 period that involved six-party talks, that involved economic cooperation, the integration of rail between the South and the North, which is a vital precondition if we're ever going to have some unification and cooperation going once again. That's now on the table. Um, we also know that the Philippine President Duterte went back to the Philippines and made an announcement after the Old War Conference that from now, from this point forward, the Philippines Vietnam and China will jointly develop the natural gas resources within the waters that the British and Anglo-American allies have been using to create conflict between these countries. So if everybody is jointly investing in these projects that occur in disputed territories, then all of a sudden you can't really get war between these countries. And that's been the, the key for a very long time. Cooperation with your neighbors creates understanding, creates a realization that we have common interest and that breaks people out of the cycle of constant war because your neighbors are something you don't understand, there's something that you can be afraid of if you don't understand it, and then you can go to war with it. So we're now at a, at a point, like Helga said, we do have a paradigm shift. It is a very exciting period to live through. We have to think very seriously about our role in bringing the West in any fashion into a greater harmonization with this before the financial meltdown strikes. We have. Uh, a lot of resources at our disposal, especially uh, with people like Fred who will be going through the battle over culture mm -hmm. and making some of the principles of mind that express themselves in science, uh, in art, in visual arts, in musical arts, intelligible and as something that we can wield as instruments and improve our understanding and, and uh, use of these, these discoveries as we fight to, you know, <laughs> as we fight to regain a culture worth living in that's fit for human beings. So with that, uh, I'll leave the floor to, to Fred. And I encourage everybody, like I said, to read Helga's speech, which you all have a copy of from the, the conference. And um, I think we should have a pretty good afternoon. Roosh uh, set up this organization a very long time ago based upon his discoveries in physical economy that were based on a principle of natural law that completely rejected that idea that collapses perpetually are the condition of man. Because sure, we can you know, make mistakes and follow uh, opinions and assumptions regarding what our, we are, what the future is, based on better lies. We can act upon ideas that are not truthful. And we can do that through our own free will to not the road around the new uh, paradigm which our organization has been talking about for decades and fighting for. Uh, the issue of what is a true human culture which is durable and fit to survive 
without expecting any uh, perpetual collapses is becoming a, a key topic in, in leading thinkers around the world. Um, because up until now, we've been told that culture is, a, is something which is fundamentally based upon the laws of the jungle. And that's what a lot of the Western uh, brainwashing has done to us, is that a lot of people think of human civilization as being something which uh, is intrinsically animalistic, it's intrinsically imperial, that nations naturally act like empires at the expense of their neighbors, eating up resources until those resources cause population uh, boundary conditions to contract closer and closer until you get a, a fundamental natural collapse of that population called the Dark Age. And then eventually after the Dark Age, the whole cycle reproduces itself. And this is what we often have all encountered with this cyclical idea of human history. Now our organization, Lyndon Uh, thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, today we have a lot to go through. I'm just going to say a few words on the world situation and introduce uh, Fred Haight, who I think everyone here is pretty familiar with, um, who's given us the honor of, of venturing a very long way from Ontario to give uh, his fourth lecture here in Montreal on the subject of reviving the principles of classical culture, which is increasingly becoming, uh, with all of the developments around the new Silk Tea, what's true, and, and act accordingly. And, Sure, we can pay the consequences of not being creative and thus, you know, resorting to barbar barbarism, wars for oil, wars for resources, and then collapse. Or we can choose to feed our, our divine side, our, the side of us which expresses creative reason in ways that no other species in the biosphere can do. So, <clears throat> the issue now of what is a culture which intrinsically does that, which which 